As you remain standing here now, our scripture lesson for today, it is out of the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, chapter number 12, one verse that we will unpack. It is as, and it reads as following, surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. This is the word of God. You may be seated. So I have the opportunity to share two consecutive Sundays preaching all three services. And so I thought I'd take advantage of this opportunity, Judge, number one. And I would do a two-part series with the overarching theme for both parts of the series, part one and part two, being this. Only God can save us. And uh, I, I do this simply out of the reading that we have here in Isaiah chapter 12. If you go back and look at chapter 11, the prophet has just been told that there will be a branch from Jesse that will come. I'm getting an echo is anybody else getting the same echo? No? Okay. Uh, maybe just a little lower on the volume. Is going, okay, maybe that's better. All right, here we go. When you look at the, the message in chapter 11, it says that, only, that, that, that there's going to be a branch from Jesse that's going to come and it's going to save them. And when that salvation takes place, chapter 12 starts out, and then you will be able to say that the Lord, it is the Lord himself. He's not going to send a committee. <laughs> He's not going to organize a different church. But God himself will come and will be our salvation. He will be our refuge. And out of that, I get the, the message, only God can save us. And so we understand clearly that that's the, the overarching message. But then what I have to realize is, is that, okay, so now we have this message that we can live with that says only God. And God is the one. And so we know that ultimately God is going to work it out. The children of Israel are great examples of what it means to really uh, be real people. Because what we find is that they are in and out of relationship with God. Some days they're loving on God and God is the best thing that ever happened to them. Other days, they are so far away from God until they don't even know who they are. And in the midst of it all, we know that God's love is still relevant and God is still present. And so what we ask ourselves, Fred, no, that's not Fred, it's not bad. What we ask ourselves is, what do we do in the meantime? How do we get from the place of struggle, the place of disconnect, the place of, 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 of burden, to the place of deliverance? And there's a space there that I like to call in the meantime. What do we do, Timmy, while we wait on God in the meantime? I know clearly that life has a way of throwing us some things that will rock our world. I started dealing with death and dying way too early. In my own personal life, Mike, I still remember as a young, just out of high school, maybe still in high school, one of my favorite cousins was living in New Orleans. She's a few years older than me, living in New Orleans, and, and she was, she was house-sitting for her boyfriend, and, and her boyfriend, we didn't know at the time, had uh, some uh, shady ways, and dealt with some shady people. And so while she was house-sitting for him, someone broke into the house, Stuart, and beat and killed her brutally. 
so badly until she, we could not open the casket for her funeral, which really was a thing that was really bad because she was so, so pretty. Early on, I started dealing with death and dying. And what I've come to realize is that it's real for those of us who are in it. And yet, when it happens to it, it can rock our world. Somebody in the room know what it's like to really put your trust and your faith in somebody else. And to find out that after several years of faithfulness and several years of working hard at a relationship and several years of really doing your best to get it right, you find that you've been lied to, you've been betrayed, and you've been taken advantage of. Sometimes divorce comes, but all the time hurt and brokenness will follow. I've, I've had the experience of parents having to bury their children. Now, it's one thing to have to bury a parent, and sometimes that comes way too soon. I, if a 15-year-old losing a mother, it could be a real traumatic thing, but, but think about a mother losing a 15-year-old. Those are all very real things that life has a way of throwing at us. And so, Brother Jerry, what I thought I'd talk about today, and, and I'll do some more of this next week in a different kind of way, is to give us an opportunity to, to first of all, declare we know that God's going to save us. We know that God loves us enough that he's going to bring us out. But the question becomes, what do we do in the meantime? Which, Ms. Janice, is why I come out with the question, what do Christians do? when we hurt. What do Christians do when we hurt? I've got some answers for you, but before I get there, I need to just kind of paint a broad stroke here and kind of give you some things that you need to grab hold of and really believe that are real if in fact you're going to get the rest of this. And the first really uh, acknowledgement that I need to make is that there is no hiding place from God. I grew up hearing people use words that back then I couldn't pronounce, Duff, but I went to cemetery, I mean seminary, and uh, they taught me a few things, and so I began to understand what those words meant. But the old preacher in the church I grew up used to say that we serve a God who's omnipotent. And it has to do with God's power and the unending power. Then they say we serve a God who is omniscient, all-knowing, all-seeing. And then he says we serve a God who is omnipresent. Everywhere you go, Ryan, God is right there. There is no escaping the presence of God. Now, can I just, Brother Bert, I, I got to confess and be real that, you know, I recognized early on, uh, Brother John, that this was real. And there was a time when I was a little uncomfortable with the idea because, you know, I had learned how to get away with some things that mama and daddy couldn't see. I had learned how to get away with some things that the folk responsible for me, you know, couldn't really see. But then when I woke up one day, Miss Sue, and realized that God sees everything, then I changed my ways and habits, and it got to be a good thing. Because what it meant was that I was always in the loving care. I was always in the loving presence of God. Not only does God see everything, and not only does God always have us on his mind and in his view, but here's the other thing that became really exciting for me, George, and that is that God knows every one of us by name. If y'all hadn't figured it out yet, names are really, really important to me. And it's so important until I developed this habit of calling names during the sermon. Not because I think you're sleeping and I want to wake you up. But if I could call John Lindsay by name, then what that means is that I know him in an intimate kind of way. If I can talk about Annette and Gordon Smith by name, 
then it says something. Debbie and Stuart Burden, to be able to call them by name means that I have an understanding of them. I have a knowledge of them. I have a care for them that is personal because that's what names are. So think about it. The God who orders the universe, the God who sends the rain and the sunshine, the God who sees and knows all things, takes the time to know you by Hey, what a joy, what a joy, and what a comfort. And so I just need you to grab hold of the fact that he knows us, and here's the rest of the story. He loves us anyway. Ha, ah, isn't that good news? Yeah, yeah, he loves us anyway. And so what I want to talk about now is how in the midst of our celebration, Miss Susie, how in the midst of our celebration of an understanding that God really will save us, how do we handle stuff in the meantime? Ergo, what do Christians do when we hurt? My first suggestion that I think you ought to take because it's real and I know it'll bless you is that you have to first of all acknowledge that what we feel is real. What we feel is real. I love the fact that Clint and Josh helped us to understand that fear is a liar. But my friends, fear is real. And if you are not careful, you will find yourself being persuaded by fear. Hurt is real. Pain is real. Shame is real. And I'm tired of church folk believing that we've got to put on a face or we've got to be in a place where in the midst of our struggles, we don't have permission to admit that we are struggling. Nothing could be further from the truth. I like the Old Testament scripture because it is full of folk who struggle all the time and God continues to use them anyway. Listen, my friends, I need you to hear me. God made emotions. And so there are no emotions that you can conjure up. That's going to throw God off. Now, I know most of you that are 50 and older, you know, like me and some of the others, we grew up having, being told you can't question God and you better not talk a certain way to God and you got to be like this with God and you got to, and George, it's all a lie. God wants us to be real with him. Because it is at our point of being real that God can help us. Do you understand how difficult it is for you to forgive somebody that you don't have permission to say to them, you offended me? If I can never acknowledge the offense, how do I get to the forgiveness? It doesn't happen. Now, as I said earlier to an earlier crowd, I got an understanding of my relationship with God, and so I could talk to him any kind of way I wanted to and knew that God wasn't going to mess me up, Miss Linda, but I didn't, my mama didn't play that. And so I got a lot of head knockings, Bill Scott. Yeah, because I kept it real with mama just like I did with God, and, you know, God was a lot more gracious than mama was. Boy, you, you know, I brought you into this world. <laughs> and you better talk to me like you want to stay because I'll take, you know, I realize that we don't practice that sometimes with one another. And it's a shame because while I'm not advising you to post it on Facebook so that the world can see, but I do believe that there is something magical about two or three people in a circle, uh, Larry, that you can look to, that you can go to, that you can believe in, and know that these people are going to allow you to keep it real and not judge you because feelings and emotions are real. 
And if you're not allowed to experience them, to process them, to acknowledge them, then you live in a place of being trapped because the reality is not something you can deal with. My friends, many of us have heavyweight baggage when we meet people because we've not been able to unload it. We've not been able to, to share it. But I'm here to tell you that God wants you to share it. And here's the other thing I need you to get as I go on. The reason it's okay for you to share and to admit your emotions and how you feel is because, Duff, I've come to realize that my feelings, my emotions, or my thoughts, none of them, Ryan, make me who I am. And neither do yours. You say, well, what are you talking about, preacher? Well, so I'm not quite as saved as I'm going to be. Particularly when it comes to dealing with people who drive poorly. Okay? People talk about where I stay, and I need y'all to hear this because this is really the God heaven truth. I live in Fall Creek, which is off uh, Beltway and Wilson Road. So I get on the Beltway, and I've got a 10-minute ride on the Beltway coming east. It's a smooth ride. I get on the Beltway, and Peggy, I get as far out the Beltway as 45, and then I get on 45 north, and I come this way, and unless somebody is really making a mess, you see, we're outside the traffic, so I'm at the, it's a smooth ride. Then I get down 45 to 29, 20. Oh, you too, huh? So can I just say all hell breaks loose? I'm in more trouble driving down 2920 than I am 45 or the Beltway. And here's what happens. I'm driving down the street, and you know the lanes are there, and we're driving, and all of a sudden everything just kind of slows because you've got two cars that are just kind of moseying along up front, and, you know, they're just moseying along, and so you kind of get past, and you get through it, and all of a sudden when you get close enough to one to figure out what's going on and why they're holding up traffic, you find that most times you'll find that they've got their steering wheel in one hand, and they've got that dead blasted phone in the other. Well, Boots, I got to tell you, pastor needs prayer. Because what happens is I begin to feel some kind of way about them folk driving bad with them phones in their hands. And when my wife is with me, she has a tendency to get a little concerned because I have a tendency to express out loud how I'm feeling about whoever the driver is. And if I'm really feeling it, Steve, not only will I express how I feel, but I'll go on down the road and put together some plans about an appropriate response to that bad driver. To which my wife says, now, now, dear, that is not the Christian approach, and that is not, the Lord isn't pleased. And, 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 and you know, and Mike, I mean, Hood, I'm, I'm making a joke of this, but I'm being real. And what I say to her is, God is very much so pleased, because guess what? He knows my thoughts anyway. He knows my feelings anyway. Now, the good news is, I don't act on them. As a matter of fact, most of the time, Brother Burke, by the time I say it, I feel better already. But what am I saying to you? Don't deny that life will throw you a curve and it'll cause you to feel a certain way. Because that's what makes us mature Christians. The maturity, see, how you write your faith story depends upon how many times you are able to say you put your faith to work. And if you have a life story, Miss Karen, where you have never been tested and you've never been tried and therefore you've never had to put your faith to work, then how much good is it? I use mine every day. 
sometimes all day long because life just keeps on happening and it keeps on happening. But the good news is I am not defined by my thoughts or my emotions. I am not defined by the things that happen to me and cause me to feel a certain way. My thoughts and my feelings are not the ones that control me because guess what? I control them. They don't control me. And what you will find is that if you can just find a safe place with just one or two safe people where there's no camera rolling, there's no pictures being taken, there's nobody's writing a script, but you're just allowed to get real and you can say, you know, I really never got past that thing that you said to me. And it's causing me pain that I need to get rid of. So can I just admit to you that hurt? And I wish you wouldn't say it again. They don't define us. They really grow us. I mean, you know, a 10-year-old would have a different response than a 30-year-old. And I'd like to think that a 30-year-old will have a different response than a 60-year-old. Because as we grow older, we're able, first of all, to get over ourselves. And I don't know about the rest of you, but, you know, I've never been one who was really uh, big on trying to impress folk. But after I got to be about 35 or 40, I realized that was way too much trouble. So I'm not out to impress. And I got to the place, Bill Epps. I got to the place to where I became comfortable being naked before God. Now, Ryan, I still don't show everybody my blemishes. I'm still not comfortable with it, and some of y'all wouldn't be comfortable seeing them either. I get that. But I am comfortable and I am confident that I can show God everything. I can give it all to God. I can let God see me as I really am. I can admit to God who I really am. And God is going to love me, not just because of it, but in spite of it. And here's the rest of the story. When you understand where your struggle is, when you understand what your struggle is about, give it to God and God will get you through it. I'm back to where I started. Only God can save us. But he's not going to save us if we're not willing to admit that we're lost. Only God can heal us. But he's not going to heal us if we're not willing to admit that we're sick. Only God can mend us. But Tony, we've got to be willing to admit that we're broken if we want the healing to take place. And my friends, the good news is God stands with arms wide open with a loving heart that is full of grace and no judgment. And he says, come to me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. He says, just as you are, come and know that your pain is my pain, that your fear is my fear because I am the God who loves you and have promised to never leave you. Oh, it'll get dark and the storms of life will rock and reel. So Susie, the good news is when the storms of life are raging, we have a God who has promised us that he'll stand by us. God is our refuge and our strength, a very right now help in a time of trouble. So, Miss Sharon, we can be assured that in the midst of our struggles, the God who made us the God who knows us, the 
the God who loves us is the God we can trust to deliver us. Good news, my friends. Only God can save us. And in the midst of our pain, we can go to him for comfort. Amen? And thank God.